Hi, welcome to MMT Mondays from Real Progressives. I'm Jeff Ginter. Uh, we've been doing this for a lot of weeks now, and I'm hoping you're starting to get the idea. What we're trying to do here every Monday night is give to you the information about how the economy actually functions. We're trying to make it clear to you from the mouths of the actual economic experts, the ones who have made it clear that we have opportunities you know, economic opportunities, educational, healthcare opportunities, vocational opportunities. There is so much that we could be doing, but we're not because we have been sold a bill of goods, because we have been told by people that we have, for one reason or another, put on a pedestal, for one reason or another, given unto the mantle of expert. We believe you, we trust you, we're not even going to question you anymore. And where has that gotten us over the last 40 years? 40 to 60 percent poverty. Tens of thousands dying because they can't afford even shitty health care. Hundreds of thousands dying and they do have shitty health care. More wars fighting right now than we can count on the fingers of one hand. Where is this getting us? It's time that we started asking serious questions about how our economy works because it's the only missing link to what we have been fighting for for so long. For 40 years, we have all the policy prescriptions that we will ever need. We know what we need to do. We know what we need to accomplish. We've always known. But why does it never happen? Well, because it's too expensive. Well, because you can't tax the people more. Well, because the oligarchs. Well, because there's always an excuse. And it's always an economic excuse. Once you've won the moral argument, once you've won the argument about why this policy is necessary, you always lose the battle because you can't come up with a different way of paying for it. They have rammed a story of money down our throats and we lap it up like kittens with a saucer of milk. But we die. So what are we going to do? We have to change our understanding of finance. We have to change how we understand economics. Where does money come from? So Professor Bill Mitchell is going to help us out. This is not an MMT lesson, per se. This is a reframing of a progressive agenda. This is learning how we have talked about money, how we've talked about federal finance, has harmed us, has given us mortal wounds, and how we can utilize language to be able to change the conversation, change the narrative, and thus change the understanding of the people that really matter. Us, you, me, everyone. The politicians, to hell with them. The oligarchs, to hell with them. We know who these people are. We know what they want. But they can't have what they want if we understand what the game is. If we understand how the economy actually works. They will fail miserably every time. That's what we're on about. That's what this is all about. So thanks for joining us. Please enjoy Bill Mitchell reframing the conversation for a progressive agenda. And I'll be back afterwards. Talk to you soon. May I introduce Professor Bill Mitchell. Uh, thanks very much to Prue and Deborah for their fantastic, rapid work in getting this together. It's very appreciated. Um, now, normally, uh, if I've got a small audience, I usually start off with an exercise in humiliation where I have a little quiz and uh, I, I force people to show hands and then uh, we, we have a group humiliation, but I don't think I can have mass humiliation. But here's two, <laughs> here's two questions to think about. You don't have to show your hands. And uh, no one will ever know, except yourselves, about what your answers are. So here's two. I could ask any number of questions, but here's two. two. Do you agree with the proposition that when the f national government taxes you, you're providing them with funds that allows them to spend? So I, I know that those who read my blog will know the answer, but those who don't necessarily will get confused by my prolix English, 
think about what you think about that. The second, a second question might be, when the government sells debt to the private bond traders, are they raising money which allows them to spend above the tax revenue that they earn? Now, I can, uh, I can tell you that on the basis of my uh, fairly long experience in asking these sort of questions, 95% of the audience, no matter how progressive they are, on social policy, on climate change, or on, in their own perspectives, on economic issues, 95% of the people will answer yes to both of those questions, and they are fundamentally wrong in answering yes, and they are effectively operating in a neoliberal space. So think about where you were. Now what I want to talk about tonight, for about 35 minutes I guess, is this question. And um, this is work that I've been doing with uh, a colleague, Dr Louise O'Connors, who happens to be in the room tonight. Uh, and uh, her background's not as an economist and my background's not as a person who understands anything about English expression or language or cognition. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting coalition. And the, the proposition is that macroeconomics seems dead easy to me. It seems pretty straightforward and almost banal. But I also know that it's extremely, extremely difficult per se to understand an abstract concept like a macroeconomic variable. And so I, I know that it's not well understood and I also know that social media exacerbates that ignorance of macroeconomic policy, uh, uh, macroeconomic concepts and the mainstream media perpetrates the lack of understanding. And, and so we've already got a difficult set of concepts to grasp and then you overlay that with a pernicious ideology that wants to misuse those concepts for their own, to perpetrate their own ends and you end up with neoliberalism and progressive people answering yes to those two questions and thinking that they're adopting progressive narratives and policy positions when they're actually neoliberals in disguise. And the, the reason I've started to do this work on framing and the importance of language is that th there's some reason why smart progressive people buy into the neoliberal story without knowing it. And, and you know, I, I've, I've spent a career, I don't think I'm an outrider, I think I'm mainstream, but that's a, that's a, that's a matter of, uh, of description. But I've spent a whole career being vilified by my profession, which is a pretty awful pro pro profession, economics. Spent a, spent a whole career being vilified by my peers Whereas, to me, it's self-evident that neo, uh, what, what I would call neoclassical, but we now, might, you know, the gen popular, popular sort of terminology is neoliberal, how wrong it is, how it doesn't deliver any outcomes that are desirable. But the question I've asked myself is why, why didn't, you know, I thought on, in the early days of the global financial crisis, that that was it for that paradigm, that, that it was going to basically be so discredited that it, it had had its run 33 decades, it was ended. And we were going to see some sense again that this, this set of, set of uh, body of literature and thought and narrative didn't work at all. But I was wrong, it's uh, persisted. And so, you know, the, the challenge for me as, a, as an academic was to try to come to terms with how the bloody hell does this uh, uh, decrepit, non-knowledge persist to parade as uh, an underpinning for economic policy which damages the majority of us. And so I got, got involved in this, uh, this research agenda on, on framing which comes out of social psychology <coughs> and linguistics and, and the use of uh, language. So that's sort of the background. Um, now where, where lingui this my my co-author Louisa Connors, where this is this is her contribution to the project, 
is to understand the way in which humans develop what they think as, uh, as being conceptual understandings of, of things. And, you know, it's, 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 almost, it's almost over my head, which is, a, which is a perfect statement to illustrate the way in which we physically embody concepts, things we don't understand are over our heads. It's a, a physical way of, of understanding something, of coming to terms with something out there. And a lot of our thought is unconscious, that we actually end up with a whole series of inconsistent propositions that are mutually inconsistent, and we don't even know that. And so you've got the Tea Party in America running around proposing all sorts of things that, are, that, that undermine their own prosperity, for God's sake. And they don't even know it. And most of the way in which we understand abstract concepts is through the use of metaphorical language. And so, you know, the, the idea that we understand something, that something we don't understand is over our heads, that's a metaphor. That something is, that something more is good and less is bad, and more is up and, and less is down. And Fiscal deficits sound, appeal to us because a deficit is something that's down, it's less. And the, the, the way in which the mainstream economics persists in its dominance, its intellectual dominance, which, you know, it's not very intellectual at all, but the way it parades and maintains its dominance is because it strings together a series of linked myths and then buttresses them with a series of metaphors that, that, that are known to appeal to the way in which we relate to our external world and our, our, our framing of reality. And I hope this will come clear soon. So here's a, this is just a, a, a small sample of the sort of metaphors that are used by neoliberal media and economists and policy makers, you know, uh, living beyond your means. You've all heard of these in, di in various ways. You know, the, the metaphor is living beyond your means. Well, the intent of that is to, to engender a, 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 a sentiment that there's something excessive going on, that there's some sort of uh, sacrifice that's needed and that cuts are needed because you can't live beyond your means. Uh, you know, spending like a drunken sailor. Our, pr our treasurer in Australia is always talking about s government spending like drunken sailors. Well, you know, wanton irresponsibility. And so if you relate that metaphor to public spending, you've e he's immediately got a negative response because of the way we think of that metaphor. And, you know, I could go through them all, but I, I you know, mushrooming fiscal deficits. You know, so something that's mushrooming out of control, just popping up like topsy at the, at, the, at the slightest inclination, you know, uh, ballooning deficits, out of control, something's just going wild, and uh, so on, so, f so forth. A every day you'll see these in the financial media, you'll see the highest politicians in all of our countries using these metaphors, and they have a strict intent to undermine the public's confidence in macroeconomic interventions by governments, to undermine the confidence that we might have and the trust we might have in governments that seek to challenge the so-called self-regulating private market. And it's, uh, and, and it's a, a body of theory that has no evidential basis, that is internally inconsistent as a theoretical body. You know, I could talk about that for, for years. It's a body of theory that has theoretical inconsistencies, has no real evidence base, yet it dominates because of the use of the language and the metaphors that buttress it and, and support it. And, and that type of way of conducting narratives in the public policy debate sucks progressives in because they then 
get locked into debating in the same metaphorical space, as if the go a national government like the British government can run out of money. How can the British government that issues the pound run out of pounds? It's like saying that they've got to stop the test match at Lords. Well, they could have, the Lords was a good one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at Edgebaston <laughs> because the scoreboard had run out of uh, points to put up on the scoreboard. It's Australia. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> the pitch was doctored. <laughs> and you know, when, when you confront progressive politicians and their think tanks or whatever, they, they say, well, we've got to talk like this because it's the real politic. And so they come out with things like we've got to balance the budget over the cycle, which, which apparently makes them look reasonable, it just makes them look like dopes. <laughs> that we've got to tax the rich to pay for infrastructure. Well, no, you don't. The, the, the savings of the rich have got no, no relevance to what a government can do to advance public welfare. You might want to tax the rich for, for equity reasons, but you don't need to get their money. That's sort of like saying that Anne Rand was right. In, in, in her book that we all rely on the hard work of the, the entrepreneurs. Well, no, we don't. That's playing into the, the, the neoliberal metaphorical story. Or we've got to tax the rich to improve the services of the poor. Well, no, you don't. If a, federal, if a national government wants to provide better services to the poor, it's got the wherewithal because it issues the currency. You might want to tax the rich if you want them to have less money to spend. But that's, a, that's, that's for a separate motive. That's nothing to do with uh, giving you the wherewithal to, to help the poor improve their access to public services. And by buying into this so-called real politic, I get told all the time by, by uh, uh, progressive politicians, etc., or their advisors, oh, Bill, you're just an academic, you know. We, we're out in the real world doing politics. And I turn around and say to them that by buying into this metaphorical space, you're reinforcing it and you're giving yourselves no options to ever break out of it. And that's why, that's why movements in Britain like New Labour were so have, have, are so destructive. Now, fortunately, they're proving themselves to be irrelevant, I think, but, but for a long time, they've... they've undermine the progressive agenda by basically reinforcing these neoliberal narratives. Now, now the other thing that uh, Louisa Connors taught me was that this concept of construal. And this is this idea that for a time we can be locked into a particular a set of perspectives on something and, and have these metaphors continually reinforcing them through the the news and the media and the politicians all talking this nonsense. But we have capacity as human beings through our cognitive processes and our understanding and use of language. We have the capacity to change the way we view something if we're confronted with a different set of metaphors and a different language. We can construe the same event that we thought about in one way today in quite a different way tomorrow. Now, to me, that's a very significant thing because progressive politicians and their economists have to understand this essential principle of language and social psychology and start leading again, start developing leadership by allowing people to construe things in a different way by using different metaphors and using different languages. And that's why it's so damaging for a so-called progressive politician to get up and say, well, I'm going to cut the deficit too and balance it. Well, why the hell would you want to balance the fiscal deficit? Who said that was a good idea? When you've, when you've got an external deficit and you want your private sector to start saving and they're over indebted, how the hell do you think you're going to get a surp budget surplus? Who ever told you that that was appropriate policy? And then they just, they look at me and stare and you know they haven't got a clue. They are just aping the language of the neoliberals because they think that that's what the population thinks is fiscal responsibility. But this is, a, this is a population that has been poisoned by these ridiculous metaphors to construe something in a way that's totally erroneous 
and has no application to evidence or reality, but serves an ideological agenda of a very small proportion of our population and undermines the prosperity of the majority. Let's just have a few MMT lessons here, modern monetary theory lessons. The government faces the same budget constraints as the household. We're told that the national government in, who issues the currency is like a big household. Well, no, it's not. We, all us households, we have financial constraints. We either, to spend, we've got to get an income, we have to save and spend from pro, uh, pro, foregone consumption, we have to sell stuff on eBay, or we have to borrow money. Well, the national government doesn't have to do that, ever. It issues the currency, stupid. And our own personal budget experience trying to deal with our credit cards and the rest of it has no application to a national government. None, it's totally irrelevant to the capacities and the opportunities that a national government has. A national government that issues its own currency can never run out of money, ever, ever. Get that straight, that's, that's the fact. Never ever allow a politician that you're supporting to say that and say that they can run out of money and if they do, stop supporting them. Fiscal deficits are bad and fiscal surpluses are good. There's a whole lot of metaphors that support that proposition. Well, no, they're not. Neither of those propositions are necessarily true. It all depends. For a country like Norway that's running a huge external surplus from its uh, North Sea resources, it's got very first class public services, better than here, better than Australia. Its private sector is able to save as much as they want and it can still run a fiscal surplus because their taxation revenue is so strong from the external receipts. So in that case, a fiscal surplus is good because it's taking money out which, which would create inflationary biases. But for a country that's draining spending through their external account, running current account deficit, and has a private sector that's totally over indebted and you needs to bring down its debt, a fiscal surplus in that environment is a disaster. And moving towards it's a disaster. And so it all depends upon the circumstances. You can't analyse the, the government balance independent of what the other sectors, the external and the private sector, domestic sector are doing. So progressives have to understand that and get with it. Fiscal surpluses contribute to national saving. You often hear, oh, the government's got to save. Well, what, what, what nonsense is it that a currency issuing government would save? I mean, we save as individuals and households to give us higher future consumption possibilities. That's what saving's about. Well, a, fed, a, a national government that issues its own currency can have whatever consumption possibilities it wants at any time now or in the future. It can buy whatever it wants that's for sale in its own currency, irrespective of what it's done in the past. So, so there's no, it's again in this analogy with the household, it doesn't work. And, and the other point is when, when a, a national government's running fiscal surpluses, it's squeezing, it's taking more revenue out than it's putting in in the form of spending. And it's forcing, it's squeezing us as private citizens to run down our wealth. Fiscal deficits add to our wealth. Fiscal surpluses destroy private wealth. Progressives should be saying that all the time. Well, private wealth's a good thing makes our lives more secure. So why the hell would we support a policy position that undermined that capacity? Fiscal deficits are inflationary. Well, no, they're not, necessarily. All spending has an inflation risk. And if, if spending growth outstrips the capacity of the economy, to produce real goods and services, things, then you'll get inflation. But as long as the fiscal deficit is tailored to fill the gap that our private savings overall creates, then, and keeps nominal spending growing in line with the productive capacity of the economy, then it won't be inflationary. It all depends, that's the point. There are no rules that says that 
fiscal deficit. You could run continuous deficits of two or three percent per mm. of GDP forever. Think about the US for you know eighty seven percent of its year since nineteen thirty. They've been running deficits. There hasn't been accelerating inflation in that country, and I, we could use plenty of other countries. This notion of fiscal space, you know, the OECD and the IMF are always putting out stupid papers about fiscal space, as if a currency issuing government can't buy whatever it wants. Fiscal space can only be defined, that is, fiscal space being the, what, what room has the national government got to spend in net terms? What, what room has it got? Well, the available real, real resources, the idle real resources that could be brought into productive use, that's what fiscal space is. So already, once you get out of this habit of being obsessed with financial ratios about the size of the deficit to GDP, and think about what real resources are idle in your economy, you've, you've got out of the neoliberal view of fiscal space into a progressive view. So you know that if there's mass unemployment and underemployment and marginalised workers that could be more productively employed, you know there's more fiscal space. Because if the a private sector isn't making those resources productive, well, then there's only one sector left. Thanks very much. Public sector. So the shift from fiscal space being defined in terms of financial ratios, you know, a, de a, a deficit of 10% might be appropriate just as a, f a deficit of 2% might be appropriate. So there's no rule that says a, a fiscal deficit of 2% of GDP is better than a fiscal deficit of 10%. It all depends. The, the concept we've shift, we shift, progressives have to shift the concept of fiscal space from a narrow, isolated view of some size deficit or debt to GDP ratio into how many real resources are idle and what can be done with them. Okay, so now the last part of the story. So, <coughs> You know, I've, I've, I consider that modern monetary theory is, uh, is a very elegant body of, of uh, intellectual thought. It's internally consistent, it's evidence-based, it's got an impeccable uh, um, record of, of prediction, if you like. Yet it doesn't cut through. It's a minority. So the, the, that led me to this framing sort of uh, research. And so I see the task is to take that very elegant body of theory and talk about it and construct it in a way that can overcome this metaphorical tyranny that supports neoliberalism. So there's, there's, two, there's two challenges. One is to build up the level of understanding of the theoretical principles. And I've been doing that tonight a bit on those propositions. But the other is also to learn a way in which we can develop a progressive language and, and a use of metaphors that will cut through. Now I note here, by the way, that MMT is neither left nor right. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a body of theory that describes and explains how a monetary system operates. You can then overlay a value system on it, and so you could get an extreme right winger who would be an avid MMTer it would just force them into transparent statements. So they could no longer, if we all understood MMT and, what it, and, and, and the way the monetary system operates, a right winger could no longer say, we've got to have 10% unemployment because the government's run out of money. Because then everybody would know, nonsense, the government's got as much money as it wants and can buy as many real resources that are idle if it wants, including all the unemployed labour if it wants. And so the reason that you're tolerating mass unemployment is because you must have a functional reason for it, like to discipline the private sector wage determination process. So that it would force the public debate into becoming a much more transparent, you couldn't hide behind these lying metaphors anymore. Okay, so what do we do about this? Here are two visions of the economy. The left one has the economy out there and that human, the people and the, the natural environment are slaves to that, that independent entity. And so you get a whole range of propositions that, for example, this is a natural entity. It will self-regulate if it's left alone and it will deliver optimal outcomes if left alone. 
This is what students are getting taught all the time in the economics courses, by the way, for those who haven't studied economics. They're getting indoctrinated into this nonsense all the time. That's why I say my profession's a disgrace. And there's this idea that if, if you impede that self-regulative capacity, then this economy will get sick. And therefore, we all need to sacrifice and, uh, and exhibit uh, uh, rectitude, engage in rectitude to make it better again. And that if anybody in this economy can improve their circumstances by endeavour and sacrifice, and so by implication, anybody who's getting left behind as the train's cruising along. The poor, the disadvantaged are miscreants. They're to blame. There's no concept of a systemic failure. They're either to blame because they're lazy and haven't done enough themselves, or they're poor because the government has interfered with some uh, regulation or minimum wage imposition or something else that's caused this economy to get sick. And of course, the planet is just a free resource base. That's the neoliberal vision. And the metaphors that we talked about earlier reinforce that vision. And so that, that allows governments to say, we've got to pull in our belts. And we've got to t take the bitter pill, you know, using a medical metaphor. The vision on the right is what I call a progressive vision of the economy. And that is that people are embedded, not independent of the planet, we're embedded in the planet. If the planet gets sick, we get sick. And that the economy is a construction that we have created. The economy is us. We created it, we can control it, we can manage it, we can make it do what we want it to do. And we can do that through our agents, who is, are the government. And this recognises that an economy can have systemic constraints, that an individual has no power to overcome. And so we see the unemployed as being victims of a lack of jobs being created, not, not as being lazy people who want to soak up leisure and and not work, we, we understand quite clearly that unemployment's a product of a lack of jobs. And that we also understand that the government is our agent and isn't a moral arbiter. So overlaying this, uh, what's on the left-hand vision, is all this sort of Victorian morality. And so those visions are very contrasting and they give us a, a clue to the uh, 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 beginnings of a progressive agenda, in my view. And the starting point in reversing the narrative is to have big vision statements, not, not to go into a dinner party and start challenging people about basics of MMT. What's the purpose of taxes? <laughs> Forget it. Start talking about the purpose of life and collective behaviour and do we want to have everybody with opportunities? And, you know, for example, uh, some years ago, the, uh, a whole group of mayors in New Zealand created a movement that had massive political effect where their, their, their mantra was zero waste of New Zealanders a fantastic vision statement, zero waste of people, that the, the purpose of the economy was to z have zero waste and so therefore anything that we could identify as waste was intolerable, including unemployment and poverty and lack of public education, lack of training. Our youth, our future was another one of the things that they said. And these broad goals can't just be motherhood statements. So, you know, some progressive politician can't just get up and say, we believe in full employment. Well, so does the right wing. That's what they say. You've got to develop, uh, 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 use these metaphorical 
concepts, and one of them here is event causation structures that are linked to metaphors. And what that means is that uh, you, if you say we want jobs for all, you've got to also append to that type of appeal an appropriate action. Because the right wing want jobs for all too. And so an appropriate act statement, statement is that we want jobs for all and aggregate spending has to rise by X percent to generate Y million jobs. That's a much more specific statement because you've got an event, jobs for all, and then you've got causation. And, and humans metaphorically understand event causation. We, we know we, if we want something to, to occur, we know that there's got to be something to push it to occur. And so we've got a, a progressive has to say, well, we want jobs for all, but the government has to do something to, to, to get that event. And so progressive narratives tend to get lost in value statements and ignore event causation type statements. How do things happen? Well, we want jobs for all. The causation structure is if there's not enough spending, then there has to be fiscal deficits. And we have to educate people into that event causation. And I won't go for much longer. The, the, the other thing is that another metaphor is the purposes are destinations metaphor. And we intrinsically relate to our desire to achieve purposes, to achieve outcomes. And we, we relate success to the reaching a destination. In all of our life, we, we, we have this underlying sort of understanding of things. So we've got to start talking about a destination as, in this case, for example, people, zero waste of New Zealanders, and never talk about we want to have a deficit that's uh, zero or we, we think it's safe to have a public debt ratio of 60% rather than 70%. Well, why ever talk about those things? Divert the uh, debate back into into destinations that are progressive, like we don't want anybody being unemployed. People, not financial ratios. So here's another example, you know. Uh, we intrinsically are disposed to not liking government spending because the word spent, think about it, I was out running this morning and, and I could say quite, could, quite definitely, I was spent at the end of my run. I ran quite fast. Bad. Spent. It's gone. What have we got to show for it? And we, we, that language predisposes us to think of government spending as being wasteful. And then a few metaphors on top of that, like drunken sailors and running out of money, and we're, we're dead keen on getting rid of government deficits. Whereas if we said that, the government, the, the British government invested X million dollars to enhance our well-being, then we've got a totally different language and metaphorical impact because we're invoking the so-called more is up metaphor, which we immediately relate to as being something desirable. But by, by substituting the word spent by invest, Invest is more is up. We like that. Spend is exhaustion. We don't like that. That's bad. And so simple ways of manipulating the English language can change the total intent of the way in which we relate desirable policies. And another one is to, or if you read my work or hear me talk a lot, I don't use the word budget very much to describe a national government's fiscal balance. I talk about fiscal deficits. And that's because, I, because as soon as we use the word budget, the, the metaphorical link is back to our own experiences. And our own experiences have no guidance in terms of understanding or appreciating the opportunities of a national government. Uh, a couple more points here. Uh, The, the, the destination must be prominent when we talk. And so we, here we're saying the government deficit rose and generated higher levels of wealth for households and business firms. 
And so we're relating in a causal sense an event, the government deficits rose, to a desirable destination. And then we have a chance, once we have that type of language, of explaining to people how fiscal deficits are good for us in most circumstances, not always. And so this re that, that way of talking reinforces this concept of forced movement. If something doesn't happen, if something doesn't happen as a prior event, your destination won't be reached. And so if you've got a private sector that's not spending enough to maintain full employment, then the unemployment is a direct result of the lack of spending by the government. And so once you talk about the government deficit rose and generated higher levels of wealth for households and firms, you've tied the knot and you've reversed the more is up metaphor because you've been able to combine one metaphor, more is up, and in this case deficits, higher deficits is a bad thing, the way we think metaphorically. You've, you've overcome that inference by adding a, 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 pur a purposes destination metaphor, tying it together and crafting it in a skillful language. Okay, so I think I'll, uh, that's where I'm going to finish. This is from uh, John Maynard Keynes. I, I like this quote. The conservative belief that there is some law of nature that prevents men from being employed that it is rash to employ men, and remember this was written in the 1930s, so it's uh, the genders, we would improve on that now, and that it is financially sound to maintain a tenth of the population in idleness is crazily improbable. The sort of thing which no man could believe who had not had his head fuddled with nonsense for years and years. So the point was that in the 1930s, we construed things quite differently because the language was different and the metaphors were different. And so, you know, I don't know when, but if the progressive side of, of life and, and the manifestation into progressive politics gets smarter and stops supporting parties that talk about balancing budgets, then there is hope to manipulate the construal capacity in human understanding to really achieve a progressive end. And that's sort of what I guess I've devoting my academic life to. Thanks very much. This is my little ad break before the next speaker. 35% discount available. <laughs> it all goes to the publisher. <laughs> Okay, so what did you think? Ultimately speaking, you have to understand how the economy works, but then you also, on top of that, have to understand how the language is used to pull the rug out from underneath of all of us. Things like, you know, the government spends like a household. No, it doesn't. It bears no resemblance in any way to a household. Nor does it to a corporation, nor does it to a municipality or a state. The federal government of a monetarily sovereign currency is completely different. And you have to understand this. It's fundamental because the people you are going to be voting for are going to throw these things at you all the time. And you have to recognize it when it's coming your way and tell them, hey, that's bullshit and I know it and they won't be able to bullshit you anymore. But you have to learn it first. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.